Welcome to all, uh, to all of you uh, joining us for this program of the Embassy of the Dominican Republic uh, in India uh, with architects Chana Daswate from Sri Lanka and Alex Martinez from the Dominican Republic. My name is David Puig. I am the ambassador of the Dominican Republic in India. Uh, and from New Delhi, we also cover Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and the Maldives. As part of our diplomatic mission, we have been organizing for a year and a half, a series of public online conferences for audiences in the Dominican Republic. The aim of these programs is to present different aspects of the culture and intellectual tradition of this region. This is the first time we invite a practitioner from Sri Lanka, uh, and we are honored to have with us from Colombo, Chana Daswate, a recognized architect, teacher, scholar, and someone who has been involved in the preservation of the architecture legacy of Sri Lanka, in particularly of the legacy of uh, Jeffrey Bauer. Sri Lanka and the Dominican Republic, it's a fact, don't know much about each other, but they are actually countries with lots of similarities. Climate and landscape wise, of course, but also in the structure of their economies. We both depend on tourism. We both have a strong and re world renowned textile manufacturing capacities. And last but not least, have significant diasporas spread around the world who send remittances back home every year. We have all those similarities. We actually have Sri Lankan companies operating in the Dominican Republic and Sri Lankan nationals working in Dahabon and in Santiago. But in the cultural field, uh, we have until now had very little interactions. Architecture, we hope, can be a starting point for learning a bit more about each other. Sri Lanka has a rich and interesting tradition of modern and contemporary architecture that has distinguished itself for creating a recognizable style which takes into consideration and integrates the many cultural layers of the country and its specific environmental conditions. And I feel that this concern for a context specific architecture is where we in Dominican Republic can learn, study and be inspired by Sri Lanka. What we have come to know as tropical modernism is linked with the development of architecture in Sri Lanka and in particular with the figure of Jeffrey Bauer. We will, of course, hear about him today, but we will also hear about other major and lesser known modern figures from Sri Lanka, in particular, Minette da Silva. And we will also look beyond Bauer, as Shanada Wate will be talking about his own practice uh, that he has developed in the last decade after having worked himself uh, in the office of uh, Jeffrey Bauer. Um, so Chana, uh, welcome. Thank you again. You have the floor to take us through this journey uh, into the 20th and 21st century Sri Lankan architecture. Uh, as I understand it, you will speak for around 45 minutes to one hour. Then Alex Martinez, who like you is an architect scholar interested in modern architecture and a curator, will share his view for five to 10 minutes and then we will open the conversation uh, to uh, questions and answers. Thank you for everyone uh, attending. This conference is being recorded, recorded and uh, we ask you to keep your mics on mute uh, during the interventions so that the audio remains clear for all. Thank you very much. And uh, Chana, you have the floor. Thank you, David, for those kind words. Yes, indeed, it was a pleasure to meet you in Sri Lanka for the first time uh, some months ago. Uh, and thank you for organizing this. Um, I, I knew where the Dominican Republic was, thank goodness. And, uh, and of course, knew a little bit about it. Um, and uh, so it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to all of you today. Thank you for joining um, this evening. And um, I uh, will um, try and make uh, the evening as interesting as possible. So I am Chandra Daswata. I um, 
I practice as an architect in Sri Lanka and that's essentially uh, what I do. Uh, but in between all of that, I do other things. Uh, one of them and which I've always enjoyed very much is teaching uh, like Alex. Uh, I have taught for many years in the universities. I've worked as an architect for almost 20 years now. Uh, and, um, and I've also taught for that number of times. But I think once you get to a certain stage and your hair turns a certain color, you're then asked for to, to, to be an examiner. And I'm also examiner at at least two of the architecture schools. Uh, so I know a lot of the, the thinking of the young people of my country as well. Uh, and I like engaging with that. And that's really one of my favorite things. A part of, apart from the architecture side, I also um, help with uh, other cultural aspects of the country, not least uh, being a um, trustee of the Jeffrey Bawa Trust. We have two trusts here called the Jeffrey Bawa and the Lunuganga Trust. Lunuganga named after the beautiful garden that Jeffrey Bawa has here in Sri Lanka. Uh, and our remit really is, uh, apart from preserving the legacy that he left in the form of uh, two fantastic pieces of architecture, we have also taken on the legacy of maybe preserving some of the modernist uh, and the, the modern period work um, of architects here. We already have uh, perhaps two of Jeffrey Barber's buildings uh, under our belt. We look after them. We, 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 one of them runs as a restaurant. The other uh, is, is, is a small boutique hotel where people can come and stay so that people can begin to experience uh, what it was like to live in some of these buildings that were built in the 19, late 1950s and the 1960s um, here in Sri Lanka. Uh, and so what I'll do this, uh, this, 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 uh, this evening to you and morning to us uh, is that I will very quickly take you through a very short history of the country and, and perhaps the links we might, be ha we might have had over hundreds of years uh, through various <laughs> in Europe and so on. And, um, and, and hopefully through that process, you'll try and try to understand and you'll see the country a little bit. And then I'll take you through uh, some of the modernist architecture that happened in Sri Lanka in the late 50s, late 40s, 50s and 60s uh, in, in the form of three architects uh, I've known. Uh, and of course, Jeffrey Bawa with whom I worked uh, for a substantial length of time before I started my own practice. Um, so that's who I am, and I'm going to now share the screen and uh, start on this idea of, I've called it Palimpsest Sri Lanka, because it's a, it's, it's a tiny little island, but it's always had a role um, in the region to, to a role that, that, that sort of presented it as something slightly bigger than it actually is, simply because of its location. And then sometimes locations make you more important than you actually are in terms of size and shape. Uh, and that also gives you huge advantages in that uh, so many people come in and through you and that really becomes the base of a culture. So when I say palimpsest, it's because that as an architect, as a cultural uh, uh, producer, someone who actually uh, works in culture, you realize that uh, there's nothing clear and pure about uh, what we have to work with. There are so many layers of, of, of history, of thinking, of society that one engages with uh, as one works on an island uh, like Sri Lanka, which is so many uh, of these cultures and peoples passing through and has done so for thousands of years. So when you come to a particular point, uh, you can either erase it all and, and forget about it. But what the pioneers of, modern, of the modern kind of practice of architecture and even art uh, did in Sri Lanka was not to ignore it. In fact, uh, it was um, uh, one of Sri Lanka's architects, Minet de Silva, who for the first time said there can be a, uh, a, a contextual modernism. In an article she wrote in the late, late 40s, early 50s, uh, in a famous Indian magazine called Marg, uh, she brought out for the first time the idea that modernism need not be what was produced in Europe, uh, just concrete boxes, uh, but in fact, it could be uh, something that is contextual, that deals with the location that it's dealing with, but still be modern uh, in terms of the life and the engagement with the environment that it provided. Uh, so I start with uh, sharing my screen now and, uh, and, and my little talk about uh, what it is like to live and work in Sri Lanka. So I start with this sort of interesting map 
of Sri Lanka. Uh, do you hear me? I hope, uh, Alex, you can hear me? Yeah, great. Yes, um, yes. Thank you very much, yeah. And, yes, okay. and you can see the PowerPoint, Alex? Is it possible for you to see the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay, excellent. Yes. So here's the first uh, image that I put forward here. Of course, this idea that we are in an extraordinary location in Sri Lanka. If you look at the little um, dot that says Colombo, uh, and, and that's where Sri Lanka is located. If, for instance, you did a map of the world with Sri Lanka at the center of it, um, and you begin to see that, yes, of course, we are very far away from each other, but uh, Sri Lanka, in terms of the old world, uh, uh, the old world um, uh, cultures, uh, is is really very much in the center of it. And if you look at China, uh, India, Africa, and Australia, and the Indian Ocean, we tend to be uh, uh, quite central to it. And that, that has a very very key uh, effect on the way uh, Sri Lanka is positioned, both culturally uh, and also with its connections uh, to the rest of the world. But of course, if you arrive in Sri Lanka, one of the first, if you arrive in Sri Lanka by boat, one of the first things you'll see, of course, and very, I, I'm sure it's very much like the Dominican Republic, very beautiful beaches. And of course, we have a central hinterland of uh, mountains. Uh, so it's a, a little bit of mountain in the middle and these extraordinary beaches surrounding us. So really, if there were no humans, it would have been perhaps paradise. And for many years, people used to think uh, it was uh, some part of heaven that had fallen down into uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, but of course, uh, and legends about the place built up. And this is an image from uh, the 16th century, um, the Jodhpur kingdom in Northern India, uh, depicting an ancient story, which is part of our part of the world of South Asia, the story of the Ramayana, where there was a sort of terrible king who lived in, according to the Ramayana, a terrible king who lived in Sri Lanka, uh, who stole the wife of another king in India, uh, Prince Rama and how uh, he got the uh, help of a whole lot of, uh, I suppose it meant the different kinds of tribes of Southern India, but uh, there was this monkey army that he brought along uh, and, um, and, 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 and rescued his wife. Of course, what's interesting about the whole thing is that the way the painting depicts Sri Lanka is extraordinary. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place of gardens, it's a place of great beauty, but also of quite sophisticated architecture. So the, 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 the idea of Sri Lanka has been, as I said from the beginning, slightly bigger than itself. And that's reflected in this particular map, um, originally drawn in the fifth century by Ptolemy, um, the Greek astronomer and cartographer. And you'll see Sri Lanka in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Mare Indicum, it says. And Sri Lanka is shown much, much bigger even than India. And it's very, very odd. So I just presume that that's the kind of uh, impression that uh, what was going on in Sri Lanka might have given uh, Ptolemy sitting in faraway Greece. He's got all of the Mediterranean perfectly fine and in proportion, but coming to the Indian Ocean, he shows his huge little island or huge island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So, the, so it, it, it kind of seems to suggest that uh, Sri Lanka seemed to have played a, a much bigger role than it, its size uh, uh, right through history. And that's pretty interesting because it means the layers of history that we've had to deal with when we are dealing with us with ourselves in the modern world uh, is is really coming back from a from a from a, and of course remnants of that thing uh, happens to be in sri lanka all the time i've just put this image in because i think for many sri lankans um, and also historically uh, a key point in the history of Sri Lanka and its transformation as a society comes at a point in about the third century before Christ, uh, when uh, a religion or a philosophy taught by an Indian who lived in the Gangetic Plain uh, 500 years before Christ came into Sri Lanka, and that was Buddhism, uh, and, and, and that transformed for the first time uh, an outside kind of um, uh, a known outside uh, set of ideas came in to influence deeply uh, the thinking and uh, processes of life of this country. That hasn't changed for the last so many thousand years. And it also sort of came up with, uh, and, and, and it also came up with some of the ideas and, and technologies uh, that allowed Sri Lankans of the third century BC right up until uh, the 10th century 
the, allowed the technologies of creating an extraordinary system of water harvesting and the use of water uh, for their agriculture. What is shown here is, a, is an ancient reservoir built in the uh, second century BC, still being used by the village people to cultivate their paddy fields. Uh, and of course, in the distance, you see those huge structures, uh, which are Buddhist monuments, uh, reliquaries, um, the, the, the tallest of which was about 300 feet high, built in the second century BC, uh, and apparently only fourth highest in the ancient world after the three pyramids. Uh, but the water system, of course, that they harnessed, the two monsoons that come onto the island, uh, and we, of course, had this extraordinary uh, paddy cultivation that went on, which is really the mainstay of, uh, or was the mainstay of the economy until the colonial period, almost uh, 2000 years after these things started. Uh, paddy to this day, even now, is cultivated in exactly the same way it was done uh, so many thousands of years ago. And that mastery of the water system also reflected uh, culturally and architecturally. This is an image of a, of a wonderful monument called Sigiriya. If any of you are ever in Sri Lanka, this is one of, the, if there's one place you should visit in Sri Lanka, this would be one monument you should. It's an extraordinary garden from about the fifth century AD, uh, a very so, sort of Versailles. It was a king who built it, his palace on top, was on top of the Inselberg that you see in the background. And he laid out this extremely formal garden um, almost Persian-like, um, and you begin to wonder, you know, this was perhaps the first formal garden of its type in South Asia. This was before the Mughals came to India uh, in the fifth century, and they used water, and they used the monsoon rains and created sort of reservoirs on top of the rock, and when you, even today, you see them working, uh, you come down, and there are fountains that seem to work every time the monsoon comes. Uh, so they had an extraordinary knowledge of water. And that, I think, was fundamental to Sri Lankan culture um, right through until the colonial period, uh, which started in the, 60, in, the, in the 16th century. And of course, a whole lot of wonderful ruins and stuff like that, uh, which shows, um, which shows uh, lots of influences from maybe Cambodia, maybe all the sort of Indian Ocean Rim countries seem to have contributed to the architectural thoughts and ideas uh, that happened on the island for the next 2000 years. Uh, that's a sort of wonderful uh, throne room from the medieval capital of, of Polonarua. Uh, and then of course, along with all those in, in, in introductions uh, came Hinduism from our neighbor India, uh, when Hinduism sort of came, uh, Buddhism came from there as well, but then Hinduism was, there was a resurrection of Hinduism in the sixth century. Uh, and we have our own sort of bronzes and so on that were made in Sri Lanka as part of that wider South Indian culture, uh, which has now become embedded in who we are. And of course, uh, that culture with it brought a, a, a folk god called Ganesh, who both the Buddhists and the Hindus continue to worship. I mean, the one here in the middle, which I'm showing you is actually from a Buddhist temple, whereas all that's from a Hindu temple and all the others are wayside shrines that uh, Sri Lankans would even now worship at. So it's, and, and what, what it did was it integrated the ideas of two great religions of the world and began to influence the life of our people. Then, of course, uh, through the great trade routes of the sea that happened, you, you, you found that there was trade that happens all the way from Rome to Sri Lanka. We know that ambassadors from Sri Lanka were in the court of Claudius in Rome. Uh, uh, and of course, that was mostly through the Arab traders who started off in the Persian Gulf and did a lot of trading with Sri Lanka and, and the East. Uh, and with it, of course, came Islam, uh, which became very much a part of our country. Um, and of course, this extraordinary sort of group of buildings that are very much a part of Colombo uh, on a, a 19th century mosque, which you see uh, on the left side of the screen, uh, and a slightly later 1920s mosque that's in Colombo uh, on the right side of the screen. The Red Red Mosque is a huge Instagram site for a lot of young visitors who turn up in Colombo uh, because of the nature of its construction out of bits and pieces of brick. Uh, and then of course, Perhaps the closest contact we might have with your dominant culture, perhaps uh, the Dominican Republic uh, through Spain uh, is perhaps through the Portuguese colonial empire. In the 16th century, uh, we had the Portuguese turn up in Colombo and for about 150 years, we were a colonial 
outpost of the Portuguese. Um, and of course, that's the connection we have with Brazil. In fact, we have um, a, a lot of common words. Uh, we call bread pang, like you would always all do, and uh, sapatos are shoes, and, uh, and camisas are shirts, and so on. And that part of our language comes from our interaction with the 150 years of Portuguese rule on the island. Of course, it left its legacy of architecture. You have these extraordinary churches with uh, things I, I'm sure you are familiar with in your part of the world, uh, these uh, crazy altarpieces uh, carved and painted uh, with, uh, and, and, the, and, and the idea of angels and all of that came into our culture. And this is a altarpiece uh, from, a uh, from a church in Northern Sri Lanka. Uh, and that of course could, could be in Rome, but it's not. It's in a, 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 a Western town of Sri Lanka called Nigambo. And of course, our architecture changes. We just don't take on the Western models that were brought in by the colonial powers, but we begin to transform it. And you begin to see houses that have uh, Corinthian columns, but on top, you'd have a very, very Sri Lankan tropical bit set on top. Uh, these two houses are from uh, old, 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 old houses uh, in the center of Sri Lanka. But of course, by the time the British turned up, they started building their own houses, uh, own buildings. And the National Museum is a classic example of their Italianate style. Uh, and the one on the top left-hand corner uh, is, a, is, a, is a crazy, what I call the wedding cake house. It's almost decorated with icing uh, uh, around. It was almost a display of the wealth uh, uh, of the family because it just kind of said, look, see what I can do. And you had all this, really crazy buildings that came up as well. When the economy of Sri Lanka opened to become a plantation economy, where beyond the rice cultivation, we went into tea, rubber, coconut, which was exported. And those families that held those businesses uh, began to sort of uh, want to show people uh, what they, they could afford. Um, and, and you had this kind of architecture during the colonial period. And even the religious buildings, like this particular Buddhist building, began to take on uh, a European air. Yeah, you sort of, it's, it's, it's very much a, a Buddhist building, octagonal, it's got these pointed roofs and everything. But in between, you'd see the Corinthian columns and all of that that has been incorporated into uh, its architecture. So by the end of the colonial period, Sri Lanka was a total mix up in terms of what they felt was Sri Lankan. And one of their most, I mean, as, as, as a religious building, perhaps you'd be the most conservative. But here's a classic example from the 1930s. Uh, which was not at all conservative. It picked up everything that they thought was fashionable and stylish that came from the various layers of colonial involvement and made it theirs in their own sort of way. So of course it's not uh, the classic facade of a, of a classical building from Rome, uh, but it, 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 is, it is adapted uh, to house what is essentially a, a Buddhist space uh, to, uh, to, to, to of place, space of worship. Um, oops. And uh, of course, the inside of it is also even crazier. You can see the, 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 the looking up into the uh, vault of the uh, octagon, these extraordinary painted surfaces. Uh, and also you see the kind of statuary they came in. Uh, you begin to see the influence of the Indian sari, which was really not a part of Sri Lanka uh, for, a, for, for a long time. Uh, and, and the kinds of Victorian roses and violets and things like that that don't even grow in Sri Lanka are represented in the art and, and the architecture of this country. So, of course, we were a complete mess up, but when we first started building um, buildings in Sri Lanka in the modern period, perhaps in the beginning of the 20th century, we went back, most people went back to the ideas that were there in the ancient uh, ruins, they, they picked up on what was going on. Perhaps it was almost like that moment when uh, the Europeans decided to go and look back at Rome uh, during the Renaissance, uh, abandoned the Gothic and then started saying, look, perhaps we need to look back at uh, what was going on before. Uh, and here are three examples. They're sort of uh, buildings from ancient Anuradhapura from about the fifth century AD. Uh, and the one on the right hand bottom corner is from the, uh, the, the 12th century. Uh, and the top right-hand corner uh, is uh, what is the Royal Audience Hall that's up in the city of Kandy, uh, and that's what the roofs look like. So the first buildings that were built uh, almost post-independence in 1940, uh, 1948, 
uh, was a university. And that represents this extraordinary, well, was a, was a church of a school, which simply took the ideas from the ancient world and kind of uh, mat matched it up with the, um, the, the, the roof structures that they imagined might have been there on those stone columns. Uh, and that's a Christian church that was built uh, in about 1940. Um, and these extraordinary paintings by a Sri Lankan artist called David Painter, uh, which shows a sort of beardless Christ uh, crucified on a mangrove swamp. Uh, and on the left and right of the church are two portraits, uh, two paintings, one of the Good Samaritan and the other of the washing of the feet by Christ, uh, but all set in a totally Sri Lankan setting. So these paintings are from the 1960s, um, where there was also a sort of a resurgence of the idea of the nation of Sri Lanka. So even in the Christian church, which was perhaps the youngest of the religions, maybe not the youngest of the religions, there were Christians in Sri Lanka in the fifth century. Uh, but when it became a strong force in Sri Lanka, they began in the 1960s and 70s to adapt to what might be a more locally significant imagery in its architecture. So here was the architecture of a temple taken in and even the paintings are done in the manner of uh, Christ having been a local person. Uh, and that I think was uh, one of the ways in which uh, we began to connect with ourselves post-independence uh, to kind of say, well, we are uh, who we are. And the university that was built about the same time in the 1940s, again, took on those images. Uh, you had all of these kind of classical columns the proportions were European classical, but essentially uh, it was detailed uh, in the manner of the ancient uh, Sri Lankan architecture. So that's what we were in the, in, the, in the middle of the 20th century. Until, of course, we had the first architects who were educated in the Western tradition coming to Sri Lanka. This is a drawing uh, done uh, of the Ian Pierce house designed by Minette de Silva in the 1950s. Um, and for the first time, these ideas of modernism that she had learned in her, in her sojourn in Europe and her, uh, her very close association with all of those people of the modern movement uh, through her participation in the CM conferences in the early 40s and 50s uh, and her re very close relationship with uh, Le Corbusier, uh, she came up with an idea, a series of ideas that created an architecture that was rooted in Sri Lanka, use of the kind of stone and, 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 and laterite blocks and so on, but very clearly influenced by the ideas of the Brie Soleil and so on that was uh, going on uh, in, 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 in the modernist sort of conversation. Uh, but way back before that particular, this is the Ian Pierce house. These are some archival images. Uh, you can see that it's a very modern building, but it's also kind of beginning to use local materials, beginning to use local imagery like the little uh, places where you can in and temples would have these sort of um, uh, uh, lamp niches and she's beginning to use that uh, and the kind of decorative elements that we were able to produce locally in the architecture that she was making and in this particular house in the city of candy which became perhaps the first modernist building to be built by a sri lankan uh, and this was built in 1948 or 47 uh, for a family in Kandy. And in publishing this book, uh, this particular piece of work in the Marg magazine in India, uh, Minet came up with this idea of an alternative contextual modernism. She said that modern architecture need not be the sort of, uh, the, uh, need not follow the ideas that were, were promoted and spoken about uh, in, in modernism in, in, in Europe. Uh, by Le Corbusier and so on. And, and there is a letter in her wonderful sort of compilation of some of the stuff that she uh, put together as a book some years ago, a letter from Corbusier says, I think you should go back to Sri Lanka and do what you think is best for the place. So there was a kind of admission that yes, modernism was fabulous, uh, but it couldn't work in exactly the same way that it was practiced in Europe uh, in far-flung outposts like us, uh, in certainly not, uh, uh, not in Sri Lanka where it was pouring rain, uh, we had two monsoons, we had trees that would eat up buildings in about three seconds, um, so we had to sort of act differently. And Minette said that for the first time in, in, in publication uh, 
uh, in, the in the late 1940s when she published this particular house in Mark magazine. And she was, of course, the inspiration for a lot of Sri Lankan architects who later on took on the idea of modernism to inform their work. Uh, and one of the people who then took it on uh, quite strongly was a man called Valentine Gunaseker. And this is a hotel that's built in the south coast of Sri Lanka. Uh, it's very sort of uh, expressionist in its, in its, in its, in its uh, attitude. Um, it's wonderful sort of bedrooms draped on the hillsides going down to the sea. Um, and, uh, and Valentine also had worked with, uh, with Erosarinen in, in, in America. Uh, so you can begin to see some of those influences uh, coming back uh, to a tropical country and being adopted uh, to create a, a, a tourist hotel, which, as the ambassador mentioned, was one of the mainstays of our economy since the 1960s. Tourism is very, very important. So you'll see a lot of hotels this, this evening uh, with you because that's a major part of our economy. And a lot of the uh, building uh, is associated with that particular uh, uh, part of the economy. And this is again Valentine Gunaseker, who was a devout Catholic, uh, building this wonderful set of chapels and churches across the country. Uh, you can see that perhaps he's had some influences from Spain, but it's very definitely modern. He's kind of creating this uh, expressionist architecture. Um, uh, and these are, this particular church was built in 1965. Um, that's more imagery from that church. Um, and then, of course, I come to Jeffrey Bava. Jeffrey Bava, of course, had his uh, early training as a lawyer. Uh, he passed out as a lawyer um, uh, with a law degree, an English degree from Cambridge, uh, was called to the bar at the Inner Temple, uh, practiced law for a few years until he once told me uh, all he managed to do was to keep people who wanted to get divorced, continue to be married, uh, or people who uh, he was trying to save from uh, the gallows ended up being sort of hanged. So he said I, he gave up law and uh, he had a sense for architecture and went back to the Architectural Association in London and studied architecture. And when he came back, he came back with those ideas uh, that were being discussed in London at the time of tropical modernism in the old sense of the word, uh, where the idea of the Bristol Ale, the concrete was still very much part of it. And you can see his early work is almost textbook in that sense. And in a very famous book called Tropical Modernism, published by uh, Jane Drew and, uh, uh, and, 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 and her, her working partner, um, Jeffrey, one of Jeffrey's buildings is on the cover. So he was a sort of textbook good boy about tropical modernism of that part, that, that period. Uh, and this particular classroom block uh, from uh, the Sen, uh, from the Bishop's College um, is a, a classic example of it. But around the same time, he began to discover uh, the thoughts that Minet had expressed. And in this particular house that he did for a doctor in the southern city of Gaul, he begins to use a slightly different approach. Uh, it's not uh, the total tropical modernism. By then, Sri Lanka has also gone into a not too different uh, economic uh, crisis as we are in at the moment, and you had to to try and use all the local materials you could for construction. So here he's beginning to use the terracotta tiles, the plaster, uh, uh, roof tiles, timber, but of course, as you can see in a very, very modernist style, this house from 1962 uh, is still very much around, but you can see the built-in furniture, uh, fabrics that are hand-woven, uh, and of course, local art on the wall. And the crowning image of his period of that kind of tropical modernism that we now know him for in Sri Lanka and in Asia was this house uh, for Ina de Silva um, as part of his, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary house where he uses the idea of the courtyard, the urban courtyard uh, and completely local materials to create an architecture uh, that is totally Sri Lankan, uh, but also totally modern. Um, this house, of course, is such an important, played such an important role in the transformation of our uh, architectural thinking that when it was about to be demolished a few years ago, uh, the architects of the country wrote to the minister and insisted that it become a national monument. Uh, unfortunately, the lady who, was, who owned the house for whom he had built the house, sorry, I have to keep that going for a little bit, um, wanted to sell it for us because she needed the money. 
Um, and the only way the government eventually allowed it to be done was for us at the Jeffrey Bava Trust to undertake that it be dismantled and rebuilt. So it was in one of the first things that happened to a modern building in Sri Lanka, uh, we, were, uh, we, were, we were encouraged by the government uh, to dismantle the house and rebuild it. And we did in, in Jeffrey Bauer's garden in Bentota, we do have the house now completely rebuilt. Around the same time in the mid 1960s, Jeffrey Bauer made his own contribution to creating a building for tourism for which he went on to become very, very famous. Here, the Bentota Beach Hotel um, was built in 1967 uh, on the edge of the sea and between, the, between a river and the sea. And again, for the first time, while uh, Valentine Gunasekara at the Tangor Bay Beach was, um, was using a lot of concrete and was very overtly modernist, Jeffrey Bawa began to look back at how we could make a more Sri Lankan experience for the tourist. And in that process, uh, he managed to build a modern building using local materials. There is concrete, of course, which is such an important part of modernist architecture. And um, he, began, he built this building in 1967. Again, uh, because it is such an important, it's got such an important position in the history of our architecture. About uh, four years ago, I was asked to restore it. And instead of restoring it, what I had to do, of course, was to completely demolish it because the concrete inside had rotted. It was 50 years since the building had been done. And the inside, uh, the concrete structure, because it's right by the sea, had rotted. So we had to, again, what we did with the Ina de Silva house, dismantle all the bits and pieces we could dismantle and recycle, uh, and we rebuilt it. As we rebuilt the thing and understood the concrete structure that held the whole thing up, what we found was that, in fact, in an extraordinarily modern approach to structure, the uh, if you look on the top left-hand building, uh, you see these cantilevers. In fact, they're not cantilevers at all. It was two columns that went all the way to the roof, and within the shape of the roof, there was a truss a concrete truss and the balconies were suspended from them so that he could get this extraordinary sort of sense of floating uh, for that building, almost like a wooden structure, but it was only possible with concrete. It wouldn't have even been possible with wood. So in a, an extraordinary marrying of modern technology of concrete with local ideas, he created this building, which went on to, of course, influence so many others around South Asia. And that was the beginning of the tropical Asian style. Uh, which originated in this particular building. And many buildings done by architects like Terry Hill and so on, um, who were very famous for their buildings uh, in Singapore, in Vietnam, uh, this building played a major role in, under, in, 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 in setting an example. So this is the restored building. Uh, what you saw in the black and white were the images that Jeffrey had taken with his own camera. Uh, and these are images that uh, I have taken recently uh, from the completely, uh, demolished and rebuilt uh, uh, building. Of course, I added my own bits and pieces, which I'm not going to share so much with you, but this is a, a very, very important building uh, for Sri Lanka in understanding ourselves and also creating an architecture uh, that is uh, locally uh, relevant and, and, and locally, locally uh, important. Of course, the use of craft was also very much a part of Jeffrey Bawa. The entrance to the Bentota Beach is from a kind of like a cavern underneath. And as you come up the main flight of stairs, you have this extraordinary ceiling made out of uh, resist dyed fabric, batik it's called in this part of the world. And in Indonesia, it, 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 it arises in Indonesia, but Sri Lanka had its own modernist take on it. And this done by a lady called Ina de Silva for whom Jeffrey had built the first house that was moved by us. Um, she had a workshop with, uh, uh, with women from her village uh, to whom she taught these new crafts that she brought along. Uh, and this extraordinary piece of work uh, is, uh, had to be redone, of course, the old fabrics had faded in the sun, uh, but we had it all redone. And we have this incredible, uh, uh, very modernist, clean lined building, but with a lot of the local traditions and crafts uh, and maybe modern traditions being introduced to it. Uh, and that's the uh, reception of the Bento the Beach, looking across a pond uh, at the lounge and beyond the lounge, you would see the sea, uh, the swimming pool and the sea glittering in the distance. That's an imagery, that's again imagery of that hotel. 
And of course, he went on to build a whole lot more. The Neptune Hotel, just down the road, again, 1974. Um, he went on, of course, a, a, a far more famous in Sri Lanka called the Triton Hotel, uh, where he sort of uses this wonderful illusion of a pond in front of the arrival, the shining sort of flow of the, of the reception, which was sort of uh, polished uh, terrazzo. Uh, and beyond it, the swimming pool and the sea. And as Jeffrey was to say, if there was no circular, uh, if the, earth, if the earth wasn't circular, you probably would have seen Africa on the other side. But uh, that idea that uh, the building becomes very much a part of the environment that, is, that it is in uh, was very much a part of his work. And here, uh, more images of the Triton Hotel, um, very sort of maybe Florida for a moment, and perhaps something that might have even built, been built in the Caribbean. Uh, but they're kind of separate origins. Ideas come, uh, sometimes originate in different parts of the world with similar uh, circumstances, uh, and you can begin to see this happening. Of course, the crowning glory for his career was building the national parliament um, out on a lake just outside Colombo. Uh, you see this extraordinary set of roofs that float over an island uh, set in the middle uh, of, 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 uh, of a lake. Um, thank goodness for it. Um, it's one of the few places that the people couldn't invade um, uh, uh, during the recent uh, uprisings in Sri Lanka. Uh, I suppose the island kept them, the, the water kept them out. And that's the, uh, the, the parliament building a close up of what it would look like. Uh, again, very clean line, modernist lines, but of course, taking the form of the local buildings uh, with a big roof to shed the, to shed the monsoon rain uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the aesthetic of almost like a temple or a palace that might have been built uh, in the in, in period period. My own experience in architecture starts by working with a gentleman called Angel Endren, and his work was far more uh, far more modest. And in this case, this is a school that he built um, uh, for uh, an orphanage called the SOS Children's Villages. I'm sure there is SOS Children's Villages in that part of the world as well. Uh, but he was inspired, of course, by the more humbler buildings. Uh, that uh, he had come to like and uh, uh, love and so on. And, and, that, and, 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 and but, but the one thing that he said that he could afford to do was to add color to people's lives. And he used to paint his buildings. They were very modernist concrete structures, uh, simple structures that were easy to maintain, um, but with lots of color uh, for uh, the kids to sort of enjoy. Um, and of course, a recycling a lot of a lot of old doors and windows uh, and, 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 and building elements uh, to make it a part of uh, uh, the history of, uh, to, to create a sort of sense of, uh, of place uh, in the buildings he did. Um, and of course, he was again, uh, very rooted in creating an architecture for the landscape. Uh, and Angela Engine's work uh, had a huge influence on the way I looked at my own practice, uh, which you'll see more of as we go along. And one of the things that I did that made me, that really influenced the work I do uh, was the fact that he, he pushed me to do drawings, observe and do drawings of old buildings. So all of these drawings were done, as you can see in the late eighties, early nineties, when I began my career as an architect, uh, made to sit in front of these old buildings to try and understand how they were made because he believed that architecture is also a craft. It's one thing to sort of arrange spaces, but you also need to to build that thing that surrounds those spaces uh, and uh, to understand it uh, as a craft, whether it be an ancient building or a modern one, that it needs to be carefully crafted. So I, I, I began to understand that buildings are not simply things that you could, it doesn't happen naturally. Somebody has to think about it and somebody has to carefully craft it. And these drawings were part of that process through which I understood how buildings were actually made looking back at beautifully constructed old buildings. Uh, and in this particular building that you see in the screen now, you can see a lot of European influence um, in, the, in the kind of scrolls and twists and turns, but it's also very, very Sri Lankan uh, and, uh, uh, and appropriate to the place. So all of that you begin to see slightly differently when you have to sit down and look at something to draw. And I felt that that's really, that played a very, very important role in, the, the, in my own development as an architect. One of the first buildings that I was involved with, with Jeffrey Barber, and I started practice having kind of done my uh, later education in architecture in London, after two years or three years in London, 
It was time to come back to Sri Lanka. Jeffrey Bauer offered me a job. And one of the first projects I did uh, was an extraordinary hotel. And the precedence for that was of course innumerable. A few kilometers from where the site was, were some of these ancient monuments where the landscape almost dominates the architecture or the architecture embraces the landscape in a way that um, say a modern building would probably not do. Uh, these are ancient structures, ancient buildings, but you begin to see that when they built, they respected the landscape and the existing terrain. Um, and that's what we began to do at the Kandalama Hotel. The Kandalama Hotel's entrance here um, just allows the landscape to simply come into the hotel. It's just a simple concrete sort of roof with grass on top. Um, and you walked into and we allowed the rocks and everything else that was on the site to be there and simply built in and around the landscape in a very clean, modernist sort of uh, aesthetic, but uh, the landscape simply moves into and, uh, and through and around the hotel. That's the entrance, which is kind of like a cave with, with the rocks on the site on one side of it and a clean line of, uh, of, of, of plastered wall uh, and polished stone floors, taking you to a highly polished lobby, again, with a polished stone floor, looking out at this extraordinary um, uh, reservoir that was built in the fourth century this time. Uh, and that was really what the hotel was about. And eventually, the idea was that the frame structure of the hotel would be completely taken over by the jungle. Now, these photographs were taken about 15 years ago. Uh, today, you can hardly see any of this building. So if you sort of uh, Google the Kandalama Hotel and look at later photographs, there is nothing that you see. The jungle has taken, taken over and the, the animals have started nesting in it. Uh, in fact, uh, as someone told me the other day, they had been to Kandalama and they felt like that they were the ones that were being observed by the monkeys and the birds looking in through the windows. And you kind of reverse the idea that you, you're not the one looking at them, but they're the ones looking at you. And the Kandalama sort of played an extremely important role in the environmental consciousness of the country, because when we started it, everybody thought it was going to be a terrible thing and, um, and it was going to ruin the landscape and so on. But today it's considered one of the most environmentally friendly uh, and it's got all the possible awards from around the world uh, for what it is. It's a very straightforward, almost, Mesian building, um, but it's allowed the, the jungle to sort of take it on. And, 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 and Jeffrey's idea was that in the end of the day, it'll only be finally complete when the jungle has taken over and the leopards and bears are walking on its corridors. So it's this sense that the building disappears and transforms itself over time, that it doesn't have to be a singular idea that a building actually and for me, this was really, uh, I mean, I have never been able to do anything like that in my own practice, because it needed, it needs one great courage from the architect, but it also needs great courage from the person who, who commissions you, that in fact, you can't just simply do it. And the other projects that I was involved with Jeffrey Barber were a, a, a whole series of hotels, uh, the Lighthouse Hotel uh, in, in the South, in Gaul, uh, where craft plays a very, very important role uh, this extraordinary staircase that we commissioned from an artist called Lucky Senanaika, uh, which shows the arrival of the Portuguese uh, in Sri Lanka and the battle that went on. Uh, and that's an interesting kind of metaphor to the arrival of tourists and perhaps the sort of uh, metaphorical battle you sometimes have to have uh, to en en ensure that uh, you remain who you are and not overwhelmed by your visitors. Uh, and Sri Lanka has put up a pretty good, uh, good fight on that one. And that's the Blue Water Hotel, the last of the uh, large hotels that I was involved with, uh, with Jeffrey uh, Bauer. Um, and this was the very last hotel that he did. Uh, again, uh, a clean, minimalist uh, uh, sort of uh, set of ideas. Um, the chairs were designed by a designer friend of ours. Um, and uh, it still remains uh, a pretty cool, cool place to visit almost 20 years after it was built. And my own contribution to the Blue Water was one of the first projects I did on my own. Um, and because I was so overwhelmed by Bava's architecture at the time, the minimalist elegance of the Blue Water, I thought the spa that I was supposed to put in should perhaps disappear underground. So I made it almost like a garden monument. What you see is an elevation of it. 
uh, with earth covering almost the whole building uh, and with just a simple and, and you see it on the left hand side uh, set in this very beautiful almost minimalist garden that Baba had designed for that hotel uh, and because I didn't want to sort of be in the way of the garden I just created this pool and the earth that I got from the pool was made to surround the building uh, and the grass grows up onto the roof uh, and you just simply have an entrance with a, with a, with a central light uh, and, and courtyards that bring in uh, light into the spa treatment rooms. And another project that I was involved with him but couldn't complete, the Anantara uh, Kalutra um, was, was completed by me in 2015 after having been abandoned for almost 20 years. Uh, the idea was pretty straightforward. Uh, a hotel is really about service corridors that take service to guests who are hanging around everywhere. So what Jeffrey Barber did was to, uh, to the, and the central picture, you see this huge yellow wall behind the, the flags um, and what you see in this as well. So he said, that's the service corridor and the guests and the, the service moves on the lower level, the guests on the upper level. And you had these big open pavilions that were leaning against these corridors. So instead of hiding the service corridors, he in fact highlighted it as a piece of the architecture. And this then connects to bedrooms that are also attached to the long corridors that go right across the site. So again, you're adopting ideas from all over the world to, 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 to make uh, something of your own. And years later, uh, our practice, my partner Murad Ismail and I did this, um, did this uh, building uh, in the south coast of Sri Lanka, the, the Yala Safari Beach Hotel. Uh, again, by now, it was part of our vocabulary to begin to use local materials a hell of a lot uh, and um, uh, art from the local artists uh, and all of that uh, became the vocabulary that we worked with. And you'll see quite a lot of it um, as you go along, uh, like this tiny little hotel that I built uh, again right next to the Lighthouse Hotel. It was about incorporating the buildings as close as possible uh, and, and, and making it a part of the environment, um, almost entirely naturally ventilated, and only the bedroom, uh, we're, a tiny 10 by 10 space was the one that I allowed for air conditioning, um, because that's all you really require, a little bit of air conditioning to sleep, very large areas <coughs> of the room to be open to the elements. Uh, and uh, what's the point of coming to a tropical country if you're going to just only see it through a glass? So the idea was that when you walked into your bedroom, you were shut away from the tropics uh, and of course protected and so on. Uh, so I had, as you saw in the previous image, uh, the curtains are nothing really opens out. There's a little bit of ventilation if you need it, but if you want to engage, you have to come out onto this deck. And so this idea that if you want to be cocooned, you see nothing, but if you want to engage, you come out. And, and, and it works pretty well. People love being there because yes, they can get away from the mosquitoes and the rain into a tiny little space, but move along as you go along. And the same sort of Baba vocabulary of, 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 of a minimalist architecture was something I also adopted for the first big hotel uh, that I had to do on my own, uh, the Cinnamon Bay. And this is the entrance, uh, the reception, pretty plain and elegant, uh, just polished cement, uh, frame of concrete. Um, with this one work of art uh, that was made by an artist friend where he used the boats that had been abandoned and damaged. Uh, this was done soon after the tsunami. In fact, on the site of a place where in 2004, uh, we had this terrible tsunami in the Indian Ocean. And um, there were two hotels that were completely demolished because of the tsunami on this particular site. Uh, and as almost like a memorial to it, we, we collected uh, some of the fishing boats that had been damaged um, uh, in the tsunami, traditional fishing boats, uh, and got it from an antique dealer who had stored them for a while. And this artist created this idea of a lotus, uh, which obviously the idea of the lotus in South Asia is how it sort of you know, originates in the mud and the gloom, and it blooms into something terribly beautiful on the surface of the water. And this idea of the boats blooming into a lotus was the artist's idea of representing the resurrection of the tourism industry and all of us uh, from that terrible debacle of 2004. Um, and, um, and I used the same sort of minimalist vocabulary uh, to create uh, this particular hotel. 
uh, with a central instead of a courtyard. I have this big sort of slab with an oculus that lights up a central space uh, that descends down into uh, the swimming pool and the sea. Uh, one of the other projects that I was quite closely involved in involves this project. It's very close to Siguria. And, um, and this is uh, 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 something called the, the, the Water Garden Hotel, where I took the ideas, the, 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 the sort of formal ideas of Siguria, and tried to rework it uh, in a hotel to imagine what it might have been to live in this garden. And you see the sort of central axis, again, looking back at the rock, because it is sort of a few kilometers away from the hotel, uh, but creating a series of pavilions, clean line pavilions, uh, right across uh, what was essentially a garden. And for me, the most important thing about designing this was really designing the garden, which incorporated the paddy fields that were on the site, the wilderness that's on the site, uh, and, um, uh, but of course, uh, not imposing a very, an architecture that sort of shouted out, but an architecture that proceeded into the background. And the same vocabulary and uh, approach came to my own house that I'm living in at the moment. This is uh, the house that I live in, in fact, that I'm speaking to you from. Uh, it's again, uh, it recycles a lot of materials uh, and, and it's a totally open space in which I've always wanted to live. Um, traditionally, a lot of people seem to live in very open spaces in Sri Lanka. And this was kind of my own contemporary interpretation of it. Um, you come up this flight of stairs, uh, into this pretty open sitting room. Uh, uh, of course, it's filled with a lot of local art and artifacts and so on. Um, and it's a central sitting room, but the whole thing is surrounded by these lured shutters, which I recycled from an old, old building uh, that was being demolished, um, one of Jeffrey Bauer's buildings, in fact. Uh, and, and, the, and the lured shutters allows me to change my mood and so on. And, um, and of course, even the bathroom is totally open to the elements. Uh, sitting outside um, my bedroom. And that I took to a lot of my work and I'm just going to run through a whole series of images that show you the kind of uh, residential architecture I have been doing. They're all inspired by the two or three different people I worked with. Uh, they're totally open spaces. Uh, you're able to shut them in with glass shutters. The bedroom, for instance, opens totally out into the garden. Um, um, and of course you can shut yourself away. This is an urban house, which has got this kind of quite strict facade on the outside, um, but opens out into a completely open garden uh, set of living spaces um, and uh, at a roof terrace uh, in Colombo. Uh, and it's a series of these houses. This is another one, uh, which does the same thing, uh, but in different ways with different kinds of uh, art and contemporary architecture, contemporary art, uh, sort of informing the space because a lot of Sri Lankans tend to, uh, to, to have works of art in their houses. So you kind of work with them to try and incorporate them into the work you do. And this little cottage that I built, not a cottage, but of course a two-story house uh, in the hills uh, is, takes on those same ideas uh, to the countryside where you walk up, uh, if you, you walk up onto the topmost level because you arrive on the upper part of the hill. Uh, walk through this bridge to the top, and then the house itself descends in a series of very, very open spaces where only the bedrooms can really be totally closed. Otherwise, it's completely open to the elements. The, the metal screening is because there are monkeys in the forest who tend to come and think that the house is theirs. So one has to kind of uh, protect yourself from them. But of course, the breezes blow through. And of course, you, you live uh, any way that you like to live within a space like this, where the bathroom, the bathrooms and everything simply opens out uh, into the extraordinary landscape that it's a part of. Another important part of my work is, of course, uh, conservation, which I like doing is kind of, you know, taking old buildings and, and resurrecting them. And one of the places that I've worked quite a lot uh, is the city of Gaul in the south, which is built by the first by the Portuguese in the 16th century, uh, and then later in the 17th by the Dutch. And the remains we have are from the period Sri Lanka was under Dutch colonial rule. Uh, it's a World Heritage Site now, and there are some extraordinarily beautiful buildings uh, that are kind of coming together um, and being converted and restored. And I've done about four or five restorations and conservations here, which I'd like to share with you. Um, and uh, oops, 
and 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 this one in particular is is very dear to my heart it's uh, it, it's got sort of foundations from the portuguese period the 16th century uh, and it and 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 then there's a 17th century house built on the 16th century foundations which we discovered uh, and of course it was modified uh, in the 19th century early 19th century or mid 19th century during the british colonial period so what you see is the british colonial facade on what was essentially an interior or plan that was of, of the Dutch period uh, and the foundations from the Portuguese period. So the house has been in existence there for about 500 years, right through the colonial experience. Uh, and of course, now it has been bought by, uh, uh, by someone um, who lives outside the country, but comes every year for Christmas and so on. Uh, and this is kind of a contemporary take uh, on a sort of Sri Lankan style uh, that we have attempted to achieve here. Another one that I'm very, very fond of is this house called the Dutch house, which was built in the Dutch period. 1712 was when the house was built. And what you're looking at is the house that was built in 1712. Uh, we added hardly anything. I simply conserved the shell of it uh, and put in um, colors and images and, uh, and, 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 and uh, furniture uh, from the period and with a little bit of modern stuff. Uh, inspired very much by the old masters paintings that the Dutch did, the dark colors and the, and the heavy drapery, the silks and so on. So I kind of like doing some of my interiors as well. So it's quite fun to, to engage with, uh, with the building beyond its shell and its spaces. And I, I, I quite enjoy uh, bringing that life into a building as well. Uh, and again, in the fort, uh, this old house that was uh, restored and added to by me, uh, is now a hotel called the Golf Fort Hotel. And this is the sort of way that a lot of us found these buildings uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the 1990s. Uh, the World Heritage Site had just been declared, but people had just forgotten about these buildings and they were in terrible, terrible state. Uh, and we had to do some major work to bring them to that kind of state where you kind of cleaned up the walls, took off the trees that were growing in their roofs, uh, and then created interiors as well that were kind of minimalist that showed off the buildings. So that's the approach that I took to a lot of the buildings, uh, to some of the buildings where you um, uh, said, okay, we don't have to put too much into these buildings. They already have a certain character uh, and let's see how we can celebrate that character without, uh, so you have the maximalist approach or perhaps a minimalist approach to conservation. Uh, they don't all have to always be, um, uh, 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 um, uh, or period pieces, uh, you can keep them very, very low key uh, so that the building itself shines through. And I've also worked up uh, in Candy, which is in the mountains, uh, where I also have my own uh, little retreat. Um, and this is a, 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 a 13th century, uh, sorry, 14th century temple uh, that's uh, in the mountains. Um, called the Lankatilika Temple, classic example of that 14th century architecture of Sri Lanka. Uh, and that was the period when we had our first connections with, uh, uh, with Europe. Uh, and perhaps we also had Ibn Battuta, the famous Moroccan traveler who traveled in Asia quite a bit coming through this part. And the central hills, of course, agriculture had turned into terraced rice fields from the big open spaces uh, in the plains. Uh, and this is sort of life that you still have. These photographs were taken about three years ago uh, or two years ago during the pandemic when I was stuck in my house in, in the mountains. I wouldn't say stuck because it's pretty nice. And it has its own sort of cultural heritage, uh, very, very clear uh, mountain sort of art and architecture, which was also uh, the last bastion of independence before the colonial period, uh, before the full colonial period set in in 1815, when the British finally camp captured this part of, or, or conquered this part of the island uh, and made it a part of the British Empire. Uh, but all of this remained and uh, your own work uh, uh, came to, uh, I, I, it was about restoring some of the old uh, structures. This is an old aristocratic house um, belonging to a, a grand family whose ancestors were prime ministers of the kingdom. But what is also lovely about it was that it's not very ostentatious. Even the richest and wealthiest people lived quite simply on the island. And if you look at this house, it doesn't look like a sort of aristocratic residence at all, but it, it was 
And this is again, I conserved and restored it for a, for, for a friend of mine uh, using contemporary furniture and, and, and simple local materials. And uh, my own house, I mean, I usually try to, to put, my, uh, put my actions where my mouth is, and I kind of also do uh, similar things for myself. And this is my own place in, in, in the mountains. Uh, it's, it's exposed brick, painted over with mud, uh, using a lot of local craftsmen to create the doors and windows uh, because uh, imported materials are so expensive. So you need to engage with local, uh, what local traditions to, uh, to create uh, a place for yourself. Uh, and and uh, I, I've recycled a lot of the furniture, uh, the, 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 the walls remain just white plaster or, or cement so that I don't have to use too much paint. Uh, and the only paint I've used is mud from the earth and I mixed it with cement or mixed it with the plaster uh, and created the color I wanted to create. So you have to go back to basics sometimes um, to, to understand where you are. You Here you see a whole lot of recycled, uh, the columns are recycled. You see the hole is in the wrong place, but I've just left it as it is because then people know uh, it's, it's recycled. Um, and the furniture is mostly from my mother who sort of decided that she didn't want any of it. So I had to bring it along and, 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 and accommodate it uh, in the house. Um, and of course, I kind of uh, often retreat to this place when I need a little bit of, uh, 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 a little bit of rest and recuperation from all the different things I get involved in. I like getting involved in lots of things, but occasionally it's nice to go back to something. And so that I think in many ways is a, 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 a short introduction to what it's like to work as an architect uh, with the histories that we have to deal with um, in our country. And um, so thank you very much for listening to my long rant. Terrible apologies for not being able to deal with, the com with my own computer. Uh, so Anna, thank you very much for your help. I wouldn't have known what to do. Uh, so thanks for calling me and uh, sorting that out. And I hope you kind of, get an inkling of what it's like to be here in Sri Lanka. And I'm sure we have so many things to share and that we, you probably saw imagery that was familiar to you as well. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Well, um, Chana, thank you very, very much for this, uh, I mean, really um, fascinating and uh, inspiring hour that you have uh, gifted us. I mean, um, there is uh, so much to talk uh, with, with, with you, um, you know, uh, about the, the, this uh, lineage of Sri Lankan architecture that you have uh, presented to us, um, about uh, the hotels uh, that has been built in, in, in Sri Lanka, which are, uh, again, um, you know, very, very special and, and responding to the context of Sri Lanka and about conservation, about all, all this work that you have been doing uh, to preserve uh, architecture. But before we uh, open to questions, uh, I have requested uh, architect uh, Alex Martinez from the Dominican Republic, whom I introduced uh, in my opening remarks, uh, to say a few words about, uh, from the Caribbean perspective, from the Dominican perspective, about this intersection of uh, you know, cultural history, natural history and architecture, uh, which you have presented uh, for the case of, of Sri Lanka. Uh, so we've asked him to, in a way, respond to that uh, from, uh, I mean, his own um, perspective and his own uh, context. So uh, Alex, uh, you, you have the floor for, I mean, a few minutes, uh, and then we'll open the, the discussion. Well, thank you so much, uh, David, and the embassy, uh, Delhi. Um, I am extremely honored and am very happy to join this conversation. And I have to first say that I am uh, very impressed uh, uh, by uh, Chana's, Chana's uh, um, talk this after this 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 evening uh, for you guys this morning. Um, yes. I, uh, because especially I, I, I admire his uh, professional approach um, that I myself identify with between practicing architecture and teaching, and conducting research, uh, also interested in conservation and on publishing, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of, 
a, a really long, et cetera, as he said, um, that he's involved in a lot of things. Um, and he, keep, he, he likes to keep himself very busy in a lot of, in a lot of uh, things. So I am, uh, so I, uh, I, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in visiting Sri Lanka um, soon. But I think that uh, your introduction was was a very interesting kind of putting perspective on how how um, uh, uh, kind of with a parallel approach um, how similar we are uh, Dominican Republic and, and Sri Lanka um, um, uh, in some aspects um, uh, can be similar, but uh, especially in 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 there's something that it's it uh, called my attention that in terms of modernism um, in the 20th century architecture, it, something ha a funny happened that uh, when uh, um, modern architecture started in, in, in the Caribbean and especially in the Dominican Republic as well, the architects and practitioners, they, they went the other way around, um, not actually looking back in history and heritage or or traditions, but they were they 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 were interested in trying to adapt uh, a ra rationalism um, and not actually talking about uh, or approaching with a with, with a regionalism um, a view. Um, hence, Eugenio Batista uh, in Cuba. Um, um, who is uh, uh, maybe one of the, uh, the first architects of the Cuban modernity, who used the, the, the kind of the same elements that later uh, uh, Da Silva and uh, Bawa will use uh, to kind of adapt their own modernity. Uh, this happened in the, in the late 30s. So, but what happened here is that through this house, uh, which is a very famous house in Miramar in Havana, uh, the Falla Bonet house. Um, so it's, it kind of, it's, it's one of the, 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 the first Caribbean, mo modern, modern Caribbean um, manifestations of, of, uh, um, uh, of, of a modern house in, in the region. It's, it's very similar to what Bawa and Da Silva did 20 years later. But then this view kind of uh, uh, was only uh, happening in this moment at the end of the, of the, of the, of the 40, uh, of, the, of the 30s, because Caribbean architects actually looked away from that view of, of of uh, looking, of combining colonial architecture and 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 rational and, and, and rational, uh, um, a rational discourse, and they they turned their their, their view out of that uh, out of that feeling, and started to re really building in a rational, uh, um, of course, with all the characteristics. Uh, uh, needed to be adapted for uh, our climate. So, so in a way, we didn't look back on, um, till the, the 80s, actually. So the exercise that, that uh, um, um, in Sri Lanka called as, as modern, tropical modernism that, uh, that of course today it's, it's a huge and very uh, a wide term, and, and you could call that Puerto Rico and 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 and, and actual Costa Rica uh, are maybe in the top uh, uh, in contemporary architecture still using this concept of tropical modernism or tropical architecture uh, very very strongly these days. But but then looking back on on these on these uh, concepts, um, it's extremely interesting how in Sri Lanka uh, or how can we in the in in our contemporary um, practice uh, we could actually learn a lot uh, from what you guys have been doing uh, 
by looking back and learning from from uh, your local uh, experiences and 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 actually I think it's it's uh, this this kind of um, exchange experience um, that I that I'm very grateful from uh, um, uh, David's uh, and 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 the embassy's uh, whole crew of building these bridges between that side of the world and our side of the world because we have so many things to 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 learn yeah, um, and especially in in a world in, in in what's happening in in our side and it's that we are still extremely close to to in in words to to try to accommodate around a closed space and, and air conditioning all the time. Um, whereas you are um, very conscious that we, we need to st still um, open up to, to, uh, to the, the, our lab, beautiful landscapes. And, and then this is where I think that um, it's extremely valuable, um, these lessons that we've been uh, that you you shown us tonight, uh, Chana, and I am I am I am very very interested in in keep on uh, talking about this, and I I I, I want to briefly kind of uh, uh, break the ice uh, on in the Q and A um, um, session uh, by by starting to to ask you the first question, and that I and I'm I know that you are. You are involved in the in the Jeffrey Bauer uh, Trust, um, and you you didn't have time to to explain a lot. Um, what is this actually this this institution and, and the whole uh, Lundaganga uh, uh, estate and, and 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 this vision of uh, of how to celebrate uh, a legacy of an architect uh, so important in in your country and in the region and. But and in in I think that uh, I I would like to know a little bit more about this institution and about this this uh, inspiring work that you are you guys are doing um, to kind of uh, keep reflecting, producing, and 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 educating around this relevant topics uh, on built environments in the arts. So I want to um, start right away uh, asking questions uh, while the public. Um, um, here is already 10 p.m. and we have, I'm so grateful also for this for for the uh, the audience that is still, are still here with us. Um, so Chana, please let us know a little bit more of, on uh, on how this this trust uh, and what kind of uh, things and opportunities also for yes. for um, um, architects and, and artists that I'm sure that we are more than more than uh, more than one will be interested in, in in learning a little bit more yes uh, indeed um, the, the the Jeffrey Bava trust uh, was an, and the Lurugaga trust was sort of joint trust that was set up by Jeffrey Bava in his lifetime and uh, the Jeffrey Bava trust is a sort of charitable organization that is a, that is sort of empowered and and, and, and told to actually work uh, in the promotion of architecture uh, and uh, the arts, literature, almost anything to do with culture in Sri Lanka. Jeffrey Bauer had a very, very wide view of what the arts could do. That in fact, in conjunction with each other, that is really going to be uh, what, how, you, how you needed to work in the arts. The Lunuganga Trust is slightly different. It's a very private trust, which is the holding trust for a lot of the property uh, and the finances of, 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 of the trust. Uh, it, it, it is empowered with uh, engaging almost like a company to create the kind of funding that is necessary uh, to do the work we do with the Jeffrey Power Trust. So the Lunugang Trust is just simply the holding company for the financing. So the Jeffrey Bava Trust was set up uh, initially uh, to, uh, to, to ensure that um, students of architecture who Jeffrey believed uh, had to have an experience of existing architecture to truly learn from it, that you couldn't just learn architecture in a school. And one of the first things he did was to sort of set up a student scholarship for, because students in Sri Lanka didn't travel so much. One, because you didn't have the money, you didn't have the resources. So he felt very strongly that students must go out. And one of the first things the trust did was to create this little uh, little uh, 
scholarship travel grant um, for students to travel in India. Uh, and, and many students, uh, and all they had to do in return was to write a little diary and hand it to the trust with photographs and so on of their experience. So this idea that uh, you shared architecture, that you have to actually engage with architecture to learn more about it was the initial idea that Jeffrey Bauer had. And that's what he kept, it, kept on doing in his lifetime. But as after his passing, after he got ill and all of that, uh, and, and after his passing, the trustees have looked at ways in which we could promote some of those ideas uh, that made Jeffrey Bauer so important in the practice of architecture in this part of the world. Uh, so to that end, um, we have actually been involved in, um, in, in, in an annual, uh, so it's, again, as part of the sharing process, we, we instituted an annual uh, Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture. And that's always given by a, a, a well-known eminent architect from around the world. We've had, I think, architects from almost every continent. Uh, this year, we had somebody from your part of the world, uh, Tatiana Bilbao, who spoke, unfortunately, online. She was ready to come, but of course, what happened in Sri Lanka in the last few months, uh, in fact, at the time she was to come, didn't let her do, do that. So we've had Africa, we've had Europe, we've had, uh, I think the only place we haven't had an architect from is North America. We've had everyone from everywhere else, Australia, Asia, China, and so on. And they share their experiences with uh, Sri Lankan audiences. Um, it's usually online, and we have a wonderful sort of, uh, a uh, sponsor who, who, who plays, pays for a ticket from anywhere in the world to bring them to Sri Lanka. The trust are the hosts uh, and they share in person uh, their experience. And I think they're very, very well attended lectures. It's one of the big events we have um, and uh, the 100th birth anniversary event uh, where the architect Kengo Skuma spoke, in fact, had about 750 people sitting in the audience uh, listening to him. So it's a pretty popular event in Sri Lanka. In addition to that, to encourage sort of good architecture in Sri Lanka, we have something called the Jeffrey Bauer Awards, which happens every three years. It's modeled on the Aga Khan Awards, which um, where, where architects actually visit the buildings. I mean, a lot of awards are given to photographs. Uh, we believe, certainly the Aga Khan uh, Foundation believe that they must be experienced and people write reports about it before the award is given. And we have uh, modeled it on it, but for Sri Lankan architecture, we are probably trying to expand it to the region at some point, uh, but for Sri Lankan architecture, every three years where we recognize architecture that's built in Sri Lanka, it doesn't have to be an architect, it doesn't have to be an, a Sri Lankan architect, it can be a lay person who's built a beautiful piece of architecture. This idea that architecture is done by architects is something that Jeffrey also didn't believe in, that in fact, we make our environment. So we play with this idea that uh, we make uh, our own environments. And uh, so the Jeffrey Bava Trust does that. In addition to that, of course, we have now recently um, consolidated a lot of our finances. Uh, and um, we began in 2017 with a bigger team. We have our own curator of collections, Shari De Silva, uh, who's a, a trained curator architect um, who, who runs it. Uh, and we've had a whole series of programs starting with Jeffrey Barber's 100th birth anniversary where we engage with artists. So the big program for the 100 event was to ask uh, five eminent, uh, two Sri Lankan and three eminent uh, uh, artists from outside. Uh, Kengo Kuma for one, who made a beautiful pavilion in the Lunuganga Gardens. Um, uh, an art, a photographer, Dianita Singh, uh, did a beautiful photographic work. Uh, we had Li Ming Wei, who's a Taiwanese architect based in, uh, in New York, uh, also making uh, a, a, an intervening with the garden. So they were kind of interventions in the garden. Dominic Sansoni from Sri Lanka, Tanda Gupta Tenora, they intervened in the garden as though they were having a conversation. So it was a great idea, the artist in conversation with the architect's garden. Um, so we've done a lot of programs like that. At the moment, we are uh, in a couple of weekends, there's going to be open house day, worldwide open house day. Um, and we are participating in that by opening out not just only Bava's houses, because we are now beginning to engage or broaden our, our, our remit by looking at the work of his contemporaries. So, so we're trying to get, get open about two of Minette de Silva's houses. Uh, we're trying to get open, of course, a couple of Bava's houses. Justin Samarasekara, a senior architect who worked with Jeffrey Bava, Valentine Gunasekara, uh, and, and, and others, uh, to kind of look at that architecture that you were talking about, Alex, and you know, that period of 
of, of trying to make the, the modernist and the local sort of work together. Uh, so open house day, uh, 26th, 27th uh, September and 1st and 2nd October um, worldwide is also, we are also part of that process where we are opening up houses. So that way we have a team that works pretty hard to create uh, cultural experiences and studies of what's going on. And we support, of course, uh, artists and, and writers uh, uh, and, and so on. And one of that uh, support programs is that we do have a residency program at Lunuganga, the beautiful garden that Jeffrey Bauer has in the south. It's, it's kind of run as a hotel, but uh, the trust is also happy to welcome um, uh, uh, artists, writers, uh, so I don't know if you know about an art, uh, 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 know about a, uh, a writer called Michael Ondaatje, who's uh, who's written uh, lots of books, uh, a novelist. He's been in residence at one point in in Nunuganga, uh, and there are lots of others who have been there. Uh, it's not really at the moment uh, uh, in operation so much because of the troubles we've been going through in the country, uh, but uh, we've had uh, we, we we'd like to open it up to the residencies. Uh, from various parts in the world. All you have to do is, of course, uh, to make sure that you have assurances from the country, and usually it's the embassy that gets involved to make sure that the person coming is not coming for, for, for <laughs> a, a fun holiday, uh, but is actually uh, going to engage in some kind of useful uh, activity uh, that is useful to both Sri Lanka and, and to that country. Uh, so there's lots of stuff we do, uh, exhibitions, um, uh, in, in fact, at the end of October, we are, we are setting up an exhibition, uh, the trust is helping as well, uh, to celebrate the 100th birthday of Ina de Silva, the batik artist who did that fabulous ceiling at the bent of the beach. Uh, she did incredible work with a group of rural women uh, to empower rural women. Uh, so we think her life is worth celebrating. And I think we're gonna have a little exhibition and a couple of talks, which we are supporting. Uh, so we, get, we engage at different levels in the arts, uh, and of course, in the preservation of architecture. So we've taken on two Bava houses now, probably, uh, which we run as hotels and event spaces, uh, helping and advising clients to restore and look after them. Um, and, and then of course, engage, and, and, and opening them to the public so that people can engage with the architecture in a, in a very fruitful way. Uh, it's small, but we do what we can. Um, I mean, there's very little money for culture, uh, I mean, from uh, governments in this part of the world, certainly from, from Sri Lankan government, because we don't have that. Um, and also generally modern culture, modern architecture, modern art is seen as kind of reactionary in many sort of, in a, in a, in a lot of places. And uh, it's only places like the Bava Trust that actually engage with it. Uh, but, I, and, but we at the Trust strongly feel that uh, it is our contemporary life that's going to be the history of the future. Uh, and if we don't sort of study it and look after it and uh, do what we can uh, to, to, to engage with that part of our history, then uh, we are not going to have a future history. We'll probably be looking back at 2000 years all the time and that's really far away. Uh, it's good to engage with what's going on today. So the trust is very much, very much an organization in Sri Lanka that engages with the now and the today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, was, I, I just have to say thank you for inspiring us all, uh, and uh, this is an amazing uh, um, model that we we should uh, um, learn from, and, and and trying to 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 replicate as soon as possible, uh, um, because it's I think it's 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 so so important, um, um, and to kind of. Uh, uh, um, Think uh, to the, towards the future uh, with this, with uh, um, um, with such a sensitive uh, way to to uh, engage in the community, engage on on, in your, on, on heritage. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm very impressed by by how this trust that that consciously. Uh, Bawa uh, uh, thought about um, um, while he was he was practicing, and this is something that that touches me. Uh, and and I'm asking myself, like, what am I doing now, uh, thinking about the future and what I'm I'm gonna leave um, uh, and for for the future in, in my community. 
Um, so, so thank you again uh, for for sharing uh, the work of uh, our, our your own work and also the, the work of uh, of uh, Jerry Bawa's uh, uh, trust. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chana. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Chana, if you uh, have a few more minutes with us, uh, yeah, sure. You Okay, so if there is any questions, uh, we invite uh, the audience to to share it, 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 to share them. It could be just by you know taking the floor or by uh, writing them in the in the in the chat. So yes, now we we see. Well, Eileen, thank you, Eileen. Um, I will read uh, what what she's writing. Many works in Jeffrey Bauer's portfolio include gold leaf elements. What would be the provenance of the technique? Uh, what is, was it initiated slash brought by the Christians? Uh, and why Jeffrey Bauer started to make use of it? So this is a very uh, precise question for you, Chana, from someone extremely who knows. Extremely precise, extremely precise. No, the, the art of gold leafing um, uh, wasn't brought by the Christians. In fact, in the 14th century, the, I think there was an image of... Uh, the Buddha statue that's in the temple that's close to where I live in Kandy uh, was gold leafed in the 14th century. So I think the idea of leafing would have for us come from Thailand. Thailand does a lot of gold leafing and has done for many centuries. So it's likely that the at, that Sri Lankan culture at some stage did have the idea of gold leafing a lot of its statues. Um, how does it come into Bava's work? Yes, there are some elements if you look at uh, his own house um, and uh, quite a few of his uh, his works uh, his 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 works contained uh, artwork that had gold leaf in it. Um, that is a technique that came into Jeffrey Bauer's work through an interesting uh, source. It was an Australian artist uh, called Donald Friend, uh, who lived in Sri Lanka in the 1950s and 60s, um, who started using the technique of gold leaf. He eventually lived in Bali but he started using the technique of gold leaf in his paintings. Uh, and Jeffrey Bauer was a great patron of his work. He used uh, Dave, uh, the uh, uh, friend's work uh, in a lot of the decoration he did for some of the early offices and hotels that he designed uh, here in Sri Lanka. Uh, and you'll find his own house has two, uh, because they're, they're not with us anymore. They were both uh, sold in his lifetime uh, to uh, the National Gallery of Australia and uh, they, they, they reside uh, at the National Gallery there, um, uh, two magnificent gold leaf doors um, that uh, he used. And Donald Friend then taught, to, taught it to a lot of his, uh, uh, his, his contemporaries who are, or, or his, let's say, students who were working in Jeffrey's office. Uh, so the artist Lucky Senanayaka started using a lot of uh, gold leaf in his, his works. Uh, the Trust owns quite a few beautiful works by Lucky, which are gold leafed. Um, and of course, another architect, uh, student of Jeffrey Bava's, Ismat Rahim, uh, used gold leaf a lot. Uh, and in fact, Jeffrey used Ismat's work in a lot of his work. Uh, and so the gold leafing comes into, uh, uh, to, comes into Jeffrey's work in that way. Yes, a tradition is probably medieval, uh, if not ancient. Uh, we know, I mean, for instance, uh, we know that in the sixth and seventh centuries, um, I mean, on my desk, as of where I'm talking from, I have a little Buddhist, Buddhist statue with, uh, with, it's a bronze, but with elements of gold leaf uh, uh, seen on it. Uh, so we know that gold leafing would have gone on in Sri Lanka for many, many centuries. But in modern art, it came through, uh, 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 through very much through Donald Friend and his influence on Lucky Senanayaka, Ismat Rahim, and a group of young artists of the 1960s. So that's Thank a you. precise answer, hopefully. <laughs> precise answer to a precise uh, question. Uh, now I'll read. The, um, I'll read the next. There are two more questions in the in the chat. I'll read the next one. Um, well, uh, Julia Aurora um, uh, Guzman is saying hi. Thank you for this wonderful talk. As a visual interdisciplinary ast artist and about to start an architecture master's. Will you mind sharing again your opportunities and residency program? So to tell you, uh, we haven't had the thing for quite some time. We haven't had the residency, but I can uh, direct you to uh, www.jeffreybava.com, which is our website. Um, and if you email me, um, I'm chanadas 
at gmail.com, pretty easy. Uh, I can put you in touch with our curator and the one who's in charge of these things. Uh, and of course, generally what we expect uh, from our past experiences uh, is to um, that you will have to have some kind of backing from a national institution uh, supporting, your, uh, uh, supporting your residency. Uh, and the trust, of course, will give the space and the and the, and the, and the, and 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 support your accommodation uh, in the gardens. Uh, and if you go through the website, you'll see what an extraordinary place it is. Very inspiring place. Uh, so it's www.jeffreybarber.com or email me on chanadas at gmail.com, and I can put you in touch with the trusts uh, people who do it and give you all the details of the residency. Uh, we welcome any kind of um, uh, discipline, as long as uh, the uh, national institution in your country uh, or your embassy thinks that it is, uh, uh, it's useful, uh, uh, the exchange is, is going to be useful uh, to, to that country. Uh, and of course, you will have to do something in Sri Lanka that would be beneficial to share your thoughts uh, with our artists and our architects and our, and our, and our makers. And I think there was another. Thank you so much. There, there are many questions actually. Um, one okay. has to one has to do with uh, with conservation actually. And uh, uh, Mitomen is uh, Mitomen is asking why so many demolitions of uh, Bawa's work. Well, I think um, Bawa is one of the sort of people who are whose work is at the moment relatively not being demolished. I mean, I'm really, really sorry about the buildings that are happening to, to Minette de Silva. Uh, Minette was, for us, the first modern architect in Sri Lanka, the first person who was Sri Lankan to be, to talk, to think about uh, architecture in that rationalist, modernist way. Uh, and a lot of her buildings, unfortunately, they were mostly houses and so on, um, uh, are being demolished. Um, I, I seem to be the one person who has restored a Minette de Silva building. I didn't show it in my presentation, but uh, I have restored a Minette de Silva house. Uh, it's, it's very, very interesting to restore a house because you begin to restore and conserve a house because you begin to understand a little bit the thinking of the architect. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a problem with... Uh, uh, um, the lack of, of I mean, uh, uh, when they practiced in the 1930s and 40s, they practiced and built in places that are now terribly expensive. Colombo has grown and central Colombo has become, the land has become extremely valuable, both for speculation and also generally it's become very valuable. And their houses were, 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 were kind of quite open with lots of land around them. Uh, and a lot of people acquiring these look at it uh, not from an aesthetic perspective at all, but in terms of economics. Uh, so a lot of the houses start getting demolished. It's a similar thing that happened with the Ina de Silva house. Uh, Ina would never have sold it if she had her own sort of resources. Uh, she felt that, I mean, that was her only big sort of uh, thing of value. So she had to, uh, to sell it. Uh, and unless, uh, and they would have simply broken. In fact, when they finally, when we finally moved the house, dismantled and moved the house, it was re replaced by a car park. And it's classic. I mean, it was like replace paradise with a car park. I think there's a song <laughs> that says that. Uh, and that's what happened. Uh, and that's what's happening to a lot of modern architecture. And that's also because there's a lack of uh, awareness in a lot of our societies about the importance of modernism. Uh, that, uh, that in fact, who we are today is so much a part of that process uh, of rational thinking that happened. And, um, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, many of Minette's buildings are not looked after. There is an interest in her work now, uh, and, and there's a lot of work being done. Uh, there's a little museum that I'm part of, uh, I'm part of the founding committee, uh, the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Sri Lanka. We don't have a building, we don't have any place, but we actually have a gallery that has been given to us by a supporter. Uh, and one of the projects that we'll have in the near future is trying to look at her, her work, which at least uh, virtually and visually, they're creating a wonderful sort of artwork out of what's left of her work. Uh, so there's interest in the work. Unfortunately, the demolitions go on because there's no understanding of how valuable uh, the, 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 the concrete thinking, as, as, as thinking concretized is how valuable that and how important that is. Uh, we don't have an awareness. So in Bava's case, um, we've only seen about three buildings that have totally disappeared. Um, with the Ina de Silva house, uh, the Bava Trust managed to save it. 
uh, with the bent of the beach, uh, I managed to twist the arm of the big company that owns it and said, look, guys, you can't throw away history and you can't buy history. Uh, you have to, you know, you, history is history. You can't, you can't buy it. Uh, you can't invent it. Uh, so please, please conserve it. And, and they took me upon my word and, and it's a great success for them, of course. Uh, the hotel is hugely popular because it is an old building and it's got history. Uh, so um, we are lucky with the Bava buildings, but not so lucky. And that's why our next open house program uh, tries to take people uh, to some of these other buildings in the hope that uh, that period of our history will be thought about and conserved. Thank you, uh, Chana, by, for, by, for this answer. And uh, as a side note, just to mention that uh, in the exhibition at the MoMA right now, uh, which uh, some Dominicans could eventually see if they travel to New York, uh, Architecture of Independence, uh, the work of uh, Minette da Silva is present, the work of uh, Jeffrey Bauer is present, and also yes. that hotel yes. that you showed, uh, which uh, uh, yes. like, a, like a stair goes down to the yes. to, to city. So all these works are, I mean, major uh, works and, 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 and considered as uh, landmarks, uh, historical mm -hmm. landmarks. There is a question by uh, uh, Rafael Perez Peguero, um, and he says, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Much of the modern architecture you have presented incorporate labor intense and delicate artisanal work. Has there been a continuation in the interest of traditional building techniques and detailing in contemporary architecture? Is it a legacy that is being appreciated and maintained by the younger generations? Sadly, in the Dominican Republic, our artisanal craftsmen and building traditions are rapidly disappearing as more industrialized materials and building techniques are being incorporated in architecture. Uh, well, Sri Lanka has got a similar story, but we do know that because of the tradition of hotel building uh, and uh, house building, which is a major part of uh, Sri Lankan architects business um, and hotels actually spending on some of that artisanal work, we still have to we still have support for some of the artists in the work. There are some crafts that have completely disappeared. Uh, we only have, I think, one or eight craft, one or two craftsmen who still do the beautiful lac work that we used to have in the in traditional and so on. But building techniques, yes, there are people who you can still get uh, traditional building texting techniques uh, to use building techniques uh, that are very traditional in construction. Um, the younger generation, I think, appreciate the, the, the ideas that Jeffrey Bava and the modernists came up with uh, in the way they use traditional techniques to create modern architecture, and that is still being used. Um, and of course, at the moment, uh, certainly in the last 15 years, there was a major shift into modern materials, even to create the open houses that uh, we make here. Um, and there was a shift to modern materials to the extent that about 75% of our building materials were imported. And at this point in time, there is a major, major effort uh, to, to, to stop that. And one of the things the central bank has done is virtually stop all imports into the country because of our foreign exchange crisis, virtually top, stop all imports of building materials into the country. So we are going to be probably forced to go back into those traditional, slightly labor intensive techniques uh, to make our buildings. Uh, and that's kind of what happened to Bava and, and, and De Silva uh, in the 60s and uh, certainly in the 50s and 60s, when Sri Lanka had uh, slightly controlled economies, uh, we had balance of payment issues in the 1960s and imports were restricted and they had to be innovative uh, with the materials uh, that were at hand, and they often went to the traditional craftsmen uh, to make their work uh, and to work with them. Uh, so I think we are probably going coming going to see a period like that in the next uh, five years or so, when we'll have to think differently uh, about local techniques, and we might have to support uh, local traditions and local artisanal work uh, to make some of our buildings. Uh, so yes, it's it's a mixed bag. You do have a lot of people still looking out for contemporary methods and contemporary, which is fine. Uh, I think one needs to do that, change with the world. Uh, but we also need to know how much we need to support uh, local artisans, because after all, it's a livelihood. We have to help uh, uh, people uh, who have a craft to engage with modern industries. 
Uh, and I think uh, in our practice and, uh, and, and, and also from the, uh, my own practice and also from uh, the perspective of the trust, uh, we try to encourage that uh, because otherwise we lose a legacy uh, that we can all support. Thank you, uh, Chana. There is a question, there was a question before uh, and I didn't see it from Tony. Can it be said that in modern architecture in Sri Lanka from the 40s, there are influences of architects such as Mies van der Rohe and Lloyd Wright. I, absolutely. And I think uh, you, you can begin to see that uh, uh, the first generation of Sri Lankan architects were educated outside Sri Lanka. They almost all of them went abroad to America, to, to, to the United Kingdom, uh, and Minet early days uh, to India. I mean, she worked at the, uh, the, the she, she studied at the JJ School of Architecture uh, in, in Bombay. So you definitely had the, the influence of the modernists. And I, my own sort of personal theory is that uh, Jeffrey Bauer, who, who really enjoyed Frank Lloyd Wright's work, uh, may have been influenced by his sort of uh, off modernist approach. Uh, while Frank Lloyd Wright uh, is a modern architect, his approach was not the same as say, uh, uh, Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe and all of those others, uh, but took a slightly more uh, eclectic, perhaps a more uh, ro rooted in the American uh, tradition kind of a, a approach. Uh, and I, I, I definitely think uh, Jeffrey Bauer was influenced. And of course, um, there has been lots of uh, cross uh, ideas that come through. Uh, we know that Jeffrey uh, didn't know about Louis Barragan, for instance, from Mexico until very late in his career. But if you look at their, if you look at their, their careers, they're very, very similar. You, you find the early work being a particular kind of work and then the later work being very similar uh, as, as, as well. Uh, but definitely the influence of the, of the, of the, the modernists, the heroes of the modern movement uh, are seen in the work simply because they studied in those schools and those influences were the early influences that they had. Thank you. I don't see any more questions uh, in the chat, but if anyone uh, has um, another question, we would like to hear their, their voices also. I mean, we, we don't need to do it through the, um, through the chat uh, necessarily. Um, while we give time to, to anyone to, to, to have a last question, I, I would say, uh, Chana, that I was particularly interested in um, the hotels that you showed us. And uh, you mentioned that, um, of course, um, one thing is the vision of the architect, but another thing is the vision of the person who commissions uh, yeah. the, the hotel. And, uh, and it seems from what you have showed us uh, that there's been a somehow consistent uh, interest uh, from, I don't know if they're Sri Lankan or they're foreign uh, investors uh, that, that, that own those hotels, but there's been, I mean, throughout the decades, uh, consistent uh, interest in having a good design uh, for, for hotels in, 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 in Sri Lanka. And I wonder how that came to be because I mean the Dominican Republic is also a you know very very uh, touristic country if you go to our coastlines uh, there are kilometers of uh, of, of hotels um, majority are are foreign owned um, and and that might be the clue to 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 the difference uh, but but we don't uh, see that uh, let's say a forward uh, 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 thinking and forward-looking um, vision in 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 the in the hoteliers in the Dominican Republic at the moment of commissioning uh, the, the the hotels. So I'm I'm a bit curious about that. Well, I think it's a, essentially it's really because almost every one of Bava's hotels was built for local clients. There was no there, there is no, none of the hotels I showed you except the Anantara Kalutra, uh, which is owned by a Thai company. Um, with a head who has a huge appreciation of Jeffrey Bava's work personally. Uh, all the other hotels that you've seen, in fact, a majority of hotels are locally owned. And I think in it, as you suggested, is the, is the clue. Because what happens when, a, and, and recently we've had foreign owners, or foreign investors coming in, uh, they come with sort of certain ideas of reproducing something they've seen somewhere else. Uh, 
uh, and 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 often uh, even the architects are not from Sri Lanka. They tend to be someone they bring from outside, uh, and 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 they have their own vision of what what the modern hotel in Sri Lanka should be. Whereas all the hotels that Jeffrey Bava engaged with, uh, all the all the hoteliers he engaged with, and all the investors were Sri Lankan, uh, and 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 I I have a feeling as Sri Lankans because they had to compete with an outside market, uh, they were very, very interested in creating good design because they believe that good design is the only thing that we have different between say the Dominican Republic and ourselves. Why would somebody come to Sri Lanka? Yes, there are palm trees, there are elephants, there are you know, beaches, white sand, yellow sand, whatever you want, but what makes it different? And I think Sri Lankans believe that uh, the Sri Lankan investor believed that good design was their saving grace because we didn't have the money to spend on hotels. We didn't have huge amounts of money to, 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 to have fancy materials or anything like that. And we had to make do with local stuff. And they felt that within the economies that were possible, it was design that would make the difference. Uh, and I think that's the difference because it was a local clientele or local investor trying to compete with an international market and, and I think they just simply believed the only thing they had to offer was design. Uh, and, and, and I think they had Jeffrey Bauer in many ways, uh, who thought out of the box every time he came up with a hotel project. Uh, and, and that's the reason you see this incredible variety uh, of, of pretty good design uh, that, uh, that, that we have in hotels here. And, and still your uh, clients for the hotels that you have developed are, are Sri Lankan. I mean, in, all in, my in, clients have been yeah. Sri Lankan. Yeah, all almost clients. everyone. Some of the houses and so on, I've had uh, foreign people appreciative of uh, Sri Lanka coming to me. But the hotels that I've done are all Sri Lankan. Sigiriya, Beruwala, all of them are Sri Lankan clients. And I think it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it is, it is homegrown in that sense. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Well, I, I, thanks for that answer, uh, Chana. I don't see any more questions. This is really the last, uh, last chance. I mean, I think we've had uh, already many good and interesting questions, but I mean, when this it's is 10 the, o'clock, the... I suppose. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock there, so. <laughs> Almost 11. Time to well, go to bed. Time to go to bed. Uh, and for us, time to, to start the day uh, okay. in Sri Lanka and in uh, New Delhi. Again, uh, well, thank you for... Um, for this wonderful talk, Chana, and for engaging with uh, uh, all of us who've uh, asked questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Alex, for uh, having uh, accepted to be part of this and to uh, have given us the perspective from the uh, Caribbean. And I think it was quite interesting to have that counterpoint uh, in which uh, uh, we saw that, uh, let's say, in, in very broad terms in the Dominican Republic, uh, modernism went uh, uh, the other way around, maybe not the, the best way, but but it's interesting how uh, those histories are are constituted and how they determine what we are still building till uh, till today. Uh, so we thank you for that, Alex, and thanks to everyone who um, attended uh, tonight and uh, made the conversation more lively with their with their questions. Uh, this talk will be uh, well has been um, um, recorded, and uh, we will be sharing it with everyone that. Uh, was here tonight and with everyone that also registered but, but could not uh, join. And it will also be um, uh, uh, put uh, up in our uh, website, in the embassy uh, website. I hope this is uh, just the beginning of a relation between, uh, uh, I mean, Sri Lanka and Dominican Republic through architecture, uh, through uh, the work of Chana Daswate and also to the Jeffrey Bauer uh, Trust. And uh, I hope we can have uh, at some point uh, Dominican architects uh, involved or artists uh, involved in the uh, activities of the Jeffrey Bauer Trust or in the residence, as some uh, someone uh, uh, asked uh, that. Um, yeah. So, thank you again, uh, Chana. Hope to see you uh, in you, Sri David. Lanka soon. <laughs> Hope to see you in Sri Lanka, or I'll pop by at your place in Delhi. Um, yeah. So, thanks so much, and thank you everyone for listening and. Uh, Thank you, Alex, you must come. And I think there are lots of ideas I'd love to sort of explore with you. And I'd, I'd certainly like to put you in touch with our curator, uh, Shari. Uh, and I think uh, it, you will have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, I'm also very interested in, 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 in the way the, the, the different directions modernism takes in different parts of the world. Uh, 
uh, and how they contribute to the to 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 to, to, to the cultural discourse. Uh, and I think that's that's a, that, that we have obviously a huge common kind of ground that we can have on. And hopefully, we'd like to welcome you here in Sri Lanka at some point. And of course, uh, let's let's see whether the trust can introduce you to perhaps other Sri Lankan artists and so on who might do similar conversations uh, with your artists uh, and, and, and build up that relationship uh, between our two countries. Uh, so David, thank you so much for asking me. It was such a pleasure to meet you the first time and you immediately had these great ideas. Uh, so let's, let's, let's keep in touch and uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Anna, for helping me out of my trouble and, uh, and, uh, and thank you, everybody. And good thank night you. to you guys and good morning to you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.